Hey everyone, uh, my name is Martin Hochel. I work as principal software engineer for a company called Embed IT in Prague, Czech Republic, and also GDE for web technologies. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, publishing technical articles at medium.com, and I do open source at GitHub. Besides that, I'm running the biggest JavaScript meetup group in Prague. It's called NG Party. By the way, that NG stands for, for next generation. So you see what I did there? No? Anyways, why are we here today? We're going to unveil the ultimate solution of using Angular for React. And just quickly to recap why am I even talking about this, I'm going to introduce what I like and what I dislike about Angular and React in particular. So let's start, start with Angular, right? What I like about Angular. It has official style guides. That means if you switch teams or jobs, you may find the same or very similar code bases, right? Because official style guides. It has very solid architecture that scales. It has very good dependency injection framework. You have TypeScript guarantees. What I mean by that? Well, Angular is written in TypeScript. That means that any third party library is going to be written in TypeScript. And you're going to have uh, types that are up to date with the APIs of those libraries. And also, it has very good tooling, like Angular CLI. What I dislike about Angular? Hmm. Unfortunately, it has very bad component model, which is a basic building block of any single page application. It's very complex, lots of APIs, not easy to grok. Then you have Angular modules, another abstraction. I don't like it. You need to learn proprietary DSL in HTML-like templates, which is even more complex, and Angular team needs to develop their own compiler to compile stuff down. And change detection, aka dirty checking, to like sync data with the view layer, to me, it's like food gun. It's, it's very complicated, not, not very easy to, to reason about. OK, what I like about React, it has simple and robust component model. It's just done right. It's very easy to reason about. And it's just JavaScript. I know folks don't like this, but deal with it. It's just JavaScript. It has very good testability story and is mature and became an industry standard in a couple of last years. What I dislike about React, well, it has no official style guides. So if you change projects, teams, code bases are different with different libraries, etc., etc. There is nothing official. It's just React. Otherwise, you can pick from one of 200 routers or standard libraries, which is not very convenient, right? And what about type, type systems like TypeScript? No. So you have no other guarantees with third party libraries. What about Flow? I don't know, maybe just nothing. Anyways, so. I was searching for ultimate solution in last couple of months or years of my career, let's say, and I'm really proud to introduce, next slide, Reactular. And yes, you are correct. I'm messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, anyways, <laughs> so what's the ultimate solution is to cherry pick the good parts of Angular and apply it for React. And I will showcase you how to do it in various episodes, because the Star Wars team, you know. So episode one, the TypeScript menace. So why React isn't written in TypeScript, you can use TypeScript with it as well. And what is very funny, or interesting, let's say, the developer experience is much better with React and TypeScript than with Angular and TypeScript. So you need to just install TypeScript, some types for React and React DOM, and you need to set up uh, the compiler. And that's it. And then you can start develop your applications. And let's see how it uh, works in real life. Doo -doo -doo. So here's my editor. On the left side is some application. And we have some modules that we're going to showcase in this uh, talk. So let's implement some greeter component, shall we? So what I need to do, I need to go here in the start, and I will create greeter TSX. And let's uh, import React and component from React. Now I need to create a class component. Let's name it greeter, which it extends component base class. And now I need to provide some render method, which is going to return some H5 tag. Right now, what's the API of the React component? Props, because components are just functions or classes 
in our case. So let's define props for a component. I'm going to create an alias named props, and it's going to have like greeting of type of string, right? And who, again, of type of string. And class is generic, so I need to provide props right here. And now I have complete and very robust IntelliSense for my props. So I have greeting and who. And I'm going to destructure that. And now I can evaluate those bindings into my template. So I'm going to uh, just emit greeting and who. Right? So that's simple. And now we can use it. We export it here. So let's go to TypeScript demo. And I'm going to delete this. And I'm going to use my greeter component. I need to import it. And here it comes. Greeter. And now TypeScript yells at me immediately because I'm missing required props, right? So let's make it happy. What we got here? Fantastic IntelliSense. Oh, greeting. That's uh, one property. So let's say hello. Another one, who. Let's greet the world. And if we save, it's here. Hello world. Good. That's fine. Nothing ex extraordinary. Then React has this concept of default props, which are just like default props in your function arguments. And we can define those as well. So let's implement default props at our class. And let's make greeting default by telling it it's going to be hello. And when we switch back, I can again like define greeter without greeting, without errors. And it will work, as you can see. And even if I press like control space, my IntelliSense is telling me that greeter is optional. So TypeScript understands this. Last but not least, Let's define some really like optional props. Uh, let's define some color. It's going to be optional and type of string. Now what I need to do, I need to destructure the color right here. And I'm going to use inline CSS. Don't do this at home. Don't do this at home. And it's going to be just color, right? So nothing changed, right? But what I can do right now, I can go back and I can use my color, which is optional right here. And to say, let's going to be green. And I press save, and it's green, as you can see here. Well, what is m even more powerful, I can constrain those strings to type literals. So let's say I'm going to uh, allow only red, blue, and green, just like that. And when I will go back, and I will do some typo here, I get immediate compile error, right? That color is not appropriate literal. You don't, you don't get this in Angular. And even if I press control space, I have IntelliSense for all my enums that are allowed for this property. So this is very powerful indeed. And we demoed just that. OK, episode two, attack of the style guides. So Angular introduced this style guide with four bullet points that are descri describing a particular guide. Do, consider, avoid, and why. Well, they work for Angular. And of course, they can work for React as well. So let's take a look at some example for naming files. So do use kebab case for naming your files, which maps to Pascal case of the symbols, like component in this case. You can consider to use type suffix to better uh, distinguish between those types of files, like .service, .hoc for higher component, .hook, et cetera, et cetera and avoid using Pascal case and Camel case for naming your files, which is doing majority of React ecosystem. I don't know why, guys. Why should you use kebab case? Well, which of these files is, is more readable to you? I can read the second one. The first one is not really nice to read. And also, I don't know about you, but uh, have you ever come to like version control conflicts between casing and various operating systems that are case, uh, case insensitive? That's a real nightmare, so uh, kebab case is a very good solution to use. So this is just an example, and of course, we can apply these style guides to application structure. So Angular introduced this lift principle, which is nothing else, just the sugaring or architecting your applications in various modules, where you have three types, like core module, shared modules, and feature modules. And those feature modules live on their own and can be lazy loaded as well. And this doesn't apply just for Angular, but for any React app. If you're interested to learn more, I recently written an article at Medium.com, so definitely check it out. Episode 3, Revenge of the Dependency Injection. 
<laughs> so Angular has a very robust dependency injection, right? It works both at component and service layer, and they are using constructor injection on both component and services. And also, this dependency injection is hierarchical, which is very powerful. On the other hand, React has also some kind of dependency injection. We can use create context, which is mainly for for us to develop uh, applications and to avoid this prop drilling, right? So I don't have to drill the props to the whole tree, but I can just define them somewhere at the tree. And also, it's hierarchical. So if you define provider and then you define another another provider in that provider, that consumer will reference to the closest parent, which works, but it's really like primitive. So the question is, how to use Angular DI without Angular? And there is a library for that, Injection.js. Uh, this library is just extracted whole dependency injection framework from Angular to independent library, and you can use it in Node.js or on the web. And how about incorporating this with React? There is a library for that. It's called Ready, or React DI. Uh, you can check it out. And this is a tiny wrapper that leverages Injection.js under the hood with uh, adhering to idiomatic React principles. And let's uh, try it out, uh, how it looks like in a real app. So I'm going to switch here to the eye. And here we have some very simple to-do that just locks uh, some to-dos through, and I can clear this, right? So I'm going to go here into the eye. DI showcase. And first off that I need to do, I'm going to create some logger service. So let's do it right now. Logger.service.ts. And I'm going to export some class named logger. And I need to annotate it with injectable decorator, just like that. And this logger is going to have two methods. Just a log that's going to accept uh, some arg arguments. And under the hood, it's going to just uh, execute a native console log with all those arguments. So no rocket science, just for demonstration purposes. And also I'm going to implement like a warn, which will use console warn. So that's a service. Now, how can we inject it into a component? I mentioned like you cannot use constructor injection within React, but React has props. One single ultimate API for everything. So let's inject that service via props. So I'm going to def define a uh, logger on the props. Do, 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 do. I need to import it right here. OK, it's there. And now uh, let me log something. So when we will add stuff, I'm going to this props logger log. This intelligence is amazing. To do was added. And I'm also going to console log uh, when I'm clearing out all these logs, and I'm going to just warn. Cool, let's try it. Hello? Error. Oh no, what happened? I told you what happened. We just defined service. We used it in a props, but didn't register it. So what we need to do, we need to register those providers in a component tree. And how to do that, you can use dependency provider component from ready library. And it has the same syntax as Angular. So you need to provide ang uh, providers as a tokens. In our case, we're going to use logger. Uh, and next up, now this will create an injector instance of the logger. And now we need to inject it. So we can use inject component. And we're going to tell it uh, what kind of tokens we want to inject from the injector, logger, and it implements children as a function API. So it's going to be like logger, and we're going to just render or to do. And TypeScript is super powerful here, and it infers that this logger argument is of type of logger. And now we can pass it uh, to the to-dos, just logger and logger. And let's check the console if it's going to work. Hello? Hello? Guten Tag. And it was locked. And, I've, and if I clear, erase. So it works, right? This is like very contrived example, but uh, 
it's very powerful to use this whole dependency injection system. And also, Ready comes with a very nice debug tool, which will visualize your uh, injectors tree. And you just uh, press enable the debug mode. And here you have it. We have just one single injector, which is a root injector, with these registered providers, like logger, et cetera, et cetera. So tooling is there, folks. OK, so that's dependency injection with Ready and Injection.js. Next episode, a new state management hope. Oh, oh, oh. So how do we handle state in uh, Angular? Well, instances. But what's state here? Count after? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Good. What about React? React is very specific about handling state. And uh, if I'm just a newbie, I was just born, I have, I'm two years old, and I will see this code base. Oh, yay. This is state, right? Yes. I understand this. Very easy. And how to make stateful services? We introduced Ready and Injection.js, and we can indeed provide and create stateful services by just ex ex extending your default service with stateful abstract class, which, again, uses the same APIs as React. So you have state, and you have set state. And this is very easy to test as well, because uh, on the surface, it looks like it's synchronous. So your tests are written synchronous, but under the hood, it uses set state of React batching, and it's very efficient. So everything is handled for you. And with this, you can extract and create like multiple stores, if, if per, per se, if you are bored about Redux or what's cool nowadays. Episode 5, HTTP client strikes back. So Angular has very robust solution for doing AJAX requests. It's HTTP client library, which is a provider. It uses observables, and it supports interceptors. Well, in React, what are you using? You can use fetch. I don't know. But it's super low level. Or you can use Axios. Someone was smart before. Axios is just extracted dollar HTTP service from Angular 1, right? So here you have it. There is one small problem. It's not injectable. So for that, you can use Axios HTTP library, which is an injectable wrapper with ready dependency injection system within React. Episode 6, return of the router. Again, very similar story. Angular has very nice router, which, suppo which supports static route configuration, absolute or relative paths, and all these routes are rendered via some outlet, and it has lazy loading by default. On the other hand, as I mentioned previously, there are many solutions for React, but you can use the kind of standard one, which is React Router, right? And this React Router uses declarative component routing, which is nice in small app. But if you have huge scale application, it's very hard to, to see what kind of routes exist in your application. So that's kind of lacking. And you need to provide absolute paths all the time. And it has very strange handling of 404s or exact pattern matches of some particular route. Have no fear. Package for that is here. And uh, it's called Rear, like React Router Year, Rear. I don't know. I'm not good at naming stuff. But uh, it's not open source yet, but it's going to be. And let's check it out, how it, how it works. So here we have some uh, routing. Uh, this is using the React Router DOM. So we have some About page, Topics page, which has some children routes, right? Blah, 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 not found. Oi, not found. And let's take a look at the implementation, how it looks like. And if you go to the router, router demo, this is what I was talking about. So you need to use switch, exact, route, the whole path. So instead, you can use rear, which supports this router outlet component, which accepts route config. And how does it look like? Well. This is like, like exactly or very similar to Angular router definition, right? So you don't have to provide absolute path, just relative paths. And also, children routes works as well. And handling no defined route is much clearer to consumer than some route without path with React, with React router. So this works as well. And then we need to change our topics route. I'm going to comment out this switch and route. And instead, Again, I need to use router outlet. And this time, because those routes are loaded eagerly, 
uh, router outlet injects r children routes to another component, so I'm getting these right here and using them here. And if I press save and I refresh, everything should be working, working as before. So about topics, do, do, do. that works. That's nice, right? So what about lazy loading? Everyone wants to do lazy loading, Papa. So let's do that. We can use React Lazy, which is a native uh, way how to define lazy loaded components, which accept a callback, and we're gonna import or about module, and I'm gonna comment this out. And let's go back to home. I'm gonna just refresh this, and let's take a look at network panel. And now if I click on about, <laughs> you cannot see anything. Okay, one more time. Uh, one more time. <laughs> refresh, I'm gonna clear, and if I click on about, there you have it. About chunk was loaded. What about these complicated routes with children of topics? To the hell with you, children. Uh, I can do exactly the same pattern. So lazy, import. Uh, this needs to be a callback. <laughs> topics, very good. Let's comment out these static imports. And now uh, we need to refactor this as well because now we don't care about the parent routes. Topic is self-contained module. It has also defined routes for its particular module, right? So we are using just those right here. And if we reload this app again, and if I click on topics, topics chunk was loaded and all the routes have been defined. So if I click here, rendering, components, everything works. So simple as that. Okay, episode seven, the observable awakens. <laughs> So Angular uses observables by default, like all these APIs are built with observables. In React, you can use it if you want, or rather if it makes sense, right? You even should. With that said, we need to implement mandatory type ahead. Let's do that. Okay, I'm gonna close this, and I'm gonna go to Rx, Star Wars Search. So here we have some uh, field, input field, that's gonna query Star Wars API for some characters. And here we have some sa Star Wars search component, which is wrapped into a dependency, dependency provider. Here we are providing and registering HTTP client for Axios. So now all we need to do is to use observables within this component. And if I'm gonna check the console log, Right here. Ooh, so many outlets. And I'm gonna type something. Hello. We are just consoling, console logging some strings, right? So usually what you would do, you would execute the AJAX request on this handle change, which, which will crash your server because you don't wanna uh, do a get request on every keystroke. That's just insane. So instead, we can use observables and they introduce slight mind shift of how we handle state. So what we need to do, we need to create some store for streams. Um, for that, we can, we can use subject. And the subject is gonna be type of string. And subject is both observer and observable. And now in the handle change, all I need to do is just push new values into that store of streams. So term, that's it. And now I'm gonna create new observable as a declaratively map some operations like fetching the data from the server. So it's gonna be named results, and I'm gonna use this search term, and I'm gonna pipe, and we are doing type ahead, so we need some debouncing. I'm gonna debounce time for 500 milliseconds. Next one, I'm gonna use this thing and unchanged to not execute queries twice for the same uh, search terms. Uh, next, most important part, I'm gonna use switch map to just throw away the requests that are not valid anymore. And this is gonna be like term. And I need to check if term is valid. If, if it is, I'm gonna do do search of this term. 
Otherwise, I'm going to just return observable of empty array. And because I'm good Rx citizen, I'm going to also catch errors. So this uh, pipe or obser observable stream won't get completed if some error will occur. So let's do that. Errors. And I'm going to just console error that error. Just like that. And I'm going to return, again, empty observable to not break the chain. So let's try it out. Luke. There is no Luke. Why is, but isn't it working? Well, observables are lazy, which is a fantastic feature. So we need to be active and subscribe to our new created observable. So let's do that. These results, subscribe. And it's going to give us some data. And now we're going to set state those data into our components. And I'm going to open the network tab just to see all these requests. So let's query for Luke. Luke Skywalker, right here. Let's query for Lou. There is some Luminara. Let's query for some dark side. Darth. It works, right? And if I will do this, no additional request was made, thanks to Rx. So super simple imp implementation of TypeAhead within React and RxJS. Oop, that's not the right slide. <laughs> Episode 8, the last CLI schematic. Angular CLI comes with very powerful features like uh, creating blueprints and application code or building stuff and architecting. For us, schematics part is very like uh, intriguing to use, right? It's very decoupled, so you don't have to use Angular CLI for it. You can, you can just use schematics. And this is how it looks like for generating some components or even running some uh, scripts that will add some particular libraries to your code base. And with that, you have just uh, version controlled style guides of your applications, which is again very important, especially in an enterprise environment. So what is this command doing? Schematics, that's just schematic CLI package. Schematic name, that's uh, name of your package of schematics, or if your library supports some schematics, you can use that. And generator name, those are snapshots provided by those particular schematics. So in real life, if I execute this command, like schematics, component, and some path, it's going to create hero TS6 component with some class, as we can see right here. Episode 9. It has no name so far. So that's why those question marks. Web components. So Angular has these Angular elements, which allows us to like compile down Angular component to reusable web component. And anyone outside or Angular world can use those. React doesn't care, as always, right? React uh, cares just about React. But fortunately, you can use SkateJS, which is a microlibrary for writing web components. And I used to work on this project. And it's uh, very unique because it supports various renderers. So you can use a renderer React, Preact, Vue, Angular, you name it. So in our case, you can just use React as a renderer. In a matter of a couple of minutes, you can wrap your React component to Web component and chip it. And that's it. We are at the end. So let's recap what we learned today. It was a lot of stuff. We can leverage the best parts of Angular, indeed, within React apps. We introduced type safety with TypeScript, common style guides and patterns, robust dependency injection framework for React. And of course, we can use Rx for more, complica more complicated uh, use cases. And we can use CLI tools like schematics for updating, refactoring, and generating our code bases. And when you sum all of this, you have enterprise-ready application, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, if you're interested to learn more about TypeScript, React, or Redux in particular, definitely check uh, my Medium account. I'm writing a lot of stuff. And with that said, Thanks for having me, and I hope you enjoyed this conference. Thank you.